board. All right, go for it. All right, hi everyone. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Erica Koppler. I am a Lamont parent. I have Chloe in second grade and Lily in kindergarten. Lily's twin brother Lucas is in the shower. I am sure he will grace us with his presence at some point. I just want you guys to know I'm so grateful to be included in this cooking tour of all of our cultures. I've always felt um, maybe uncomfortable participating in the past when it's in the ballroom because I don't actually um, feel like I resonate with any particular country. So when everyone's putting up like the Jamaican flag and the Italian flag, I don't really have that sort of sense of home somewhere else in the world outside of, you know, New York City or Philadelphia. But I do think a big part of my heritage is being Jewish. And a lot of the recipes that I have developed come from my Jewish heritage. And I'm really excited to be sharing this particular res recipe with you today because it's a mashup that I invented. So it's one part Jewish noodle kugel meets one part Italian cacio e pepe, which is one of our favorite Italian dishes when we go out to dinner. So with that being said, two things that I want everyone to do if you are gonna be cooking along tonight. The first thing is to get your pot, um, your water in a large pot that you're gonna put your pasta in. Just turn your pot on to high so that that water can get boiling. And if you have a bunch of salt handy, just add a bunch of salt into your pasta water. I always, always like to heavily salt my pasta water because I think you're starting to flavor your pasta before you even begin to create the dish. The second thing that you're gonna do is preheat your oven to 375 degrees. Um, one of the reasons why I do this and I wrote it in the recipe, which I'm gonna modify a little bit this evening is that when one of the things that we're gonna do, so. Okay, I'm gonna start with the dish. Everyone needs a nine by 13 Pyrex. What we're gonna do is just drizzle a drop of olive oil into our Pyrex. We're gonna use a paper towel or whatever you have if you have a pastry brush, and we're gonna brush the oil all around the corners of the Pyrex. Essentially, we're greasing the Pyrex so that we can put it in the oven now. So this empty greased Pyrex is gonna go into your oven while it's preheating. What that's gonna do is it's gonna get the grease around the corners super, super hot. So when we get to the point where we add the noodle casserole into the dish, you're not only gonna end up with a crispy top, you're gonna end up with a crispy side and a crispy bottom. And that's the part that everyone's gonna fight over. So give me one sec, I'm just gonna pop this in the oven. Am I the only one cooking a lot? And Veronica? I'm cooking. You, oh, Steve, hi. <laughs> okay, so I've got two helpers with me in the kitchen. Before we get going, um, I just want to go over what you should have if you are cooking. So we have two eggs. We have a half a cup of melted butter. We have 16 ounces of cottage cheese. And we have, you know, I have a full container here of Parmesan. It says it's five, I think it's about a cup and a half. Um, we have some sour cream. And we have salt and pepper, of course. And then we have a little bit of olive oil. We already used the olive oil to grease our pan. And we're gonna use the olive oil one more time to make sure that our noodles don't get stuck together. And because this is a Jewish noodle kugel, I have Manischewitz wide egg noodles. I know like when you go to the market, it can be a little confusing, the different sizes. I like these like middle of the barrel size 
for noodle coco? Growing up, egg noodles and butter was like my all time favorite food. I was one of those kids. So it's almost amazing that I turned into a chef. Um, so at this point, I just wanna make sure that everyone who's cooking along has their empty Pyrex grease and in the oven and your water heavily salted, getting ready to boil so we can throw the noodles in there. One of the great things also about egg noodles is they cook really quick. Um, all right, so we're gonna get started. The first thing we're gonna do, and Chloe's gonna do it for me, I'm just gonna move the camera a little bit, a little bit closer to the girls. Chloe, you wanna say hi? Okay, is we're gonna crack our two eggs into our big empty mixing bowl. Make sure that whatever mixing bowl you're using is really big because we are gonna add the noodles into it. Okay, so the first thing is to crack two eggs into your mixing bowl. Okay. All right, I'm just going to take out a couple of those shells, but Chloe did a great job. And then we're going to add all of the cottage cheese. So full 16 ounces. It seems like a lot of cottage cheese, but this is really the key to the Jewish style noodle kogel. It keeps everything really, really moist. All right, so you're gonna dump the whole thing in. And then, we didn't beat the eggs or anything, right? I just beat them a little bit as I was pouring yeah. it in. But one of the beautiful things about this, okay, can you mix it? One of the beautiful things about this dish and about cooking in general is like, I'm kind of sort of lax with the rules. At the end of the day, we want to make sure everything is mixed and well incorporated. But I got my two little minions here, so it's a little, <laughs> It's a little different than I was if I was just cooking this quietly um, on my own, to say the least. Um, so in our bowl, we have two eggs and we have 16 ounces of cottage cheese mixed up well. The next thing we're going to do is add four tablespoons of sour cream. If you don't have a tablespoon, Sour, uh, four tablespoons is about a half a cup. I got this really cool, like daisy dispenser thing today. Then, like, these are the things that excite me now in COVID land. So, I'm just gonna literally give it four squeezes one, two, three, four. Mary, can, I, can I have a turn to mix? Yep, close oh, Here's such a turn to okay. Now, for those of you who don't know. Cacio e pepe is an Italian dish and it's super simple. The basic ingredients of a cacio e pepe is pasta. Usually it's like a spaghetti or a bucatini, usually a long strand of pasta. And then it's really just butter, Parmesan, salt and pepper. Sometimes you'll go to restaurants, which are really cool, where they actually have an entire wheel of Parmesan cheese and they just shave a little bit right into the bowl and they do the final tossing of the dish right in the Parmesan cheese. Okay, so in our, in our bowl, we now have our sour cream, our cottage cheese, our eggs. We're gonna add our melted butter, another key staple of cacio e pepe. We're gonna continue to mix well. Then we're going to add a cup of Parmesan cheese. Continue to mix well. If you read the paper, Erica, sorry for the interruption. Erica or Pilar, are either of you the host of the meeting? There's someone that texted me saying they're trying to get in. If you don't mind, if there's anyone else in the waiting room. Lakia wanted to join. Thanks so much. All right, while she joins, everyone go check your pasta water if you're cooking. I'm gonna add about one and a quarter bag. Hey, Kelly. Um, Hi. Egg noodles into my water. 
always when you're like i'm like crazy and i like everything i like always like to have more rather than less so i'm gonna cook about one and a half bags of the noodles to just see exactly how much we need because i can always just toss it in butter and give it to the kids for dinner okay okay finally <laughs> They're going to season our mixture. So I want to recommend for anyone who actually has the printed off recipe, we're actually going to use one tablespoon of pepper and one teaspoon of salt. The pepper is super key here. Cacio e pepe, as the name suggests, is cheese and pepper. So we really want to make sure that that pepper shines through. And then a teaspoon of salt. Make sure you're using like a good kosher or like a thickly ground salt. It really does make a difference. And then that. So thank you, Lily, for mixing. I don't know why you're holding your nose. Why well, they don't want to season the pepper. Oh, uh, Lily doesn't want to season the pepper. So the mixture looks sort of like this. Now I'm just gonna turn around and give the noodles a little stir. One of the things that I've also found that works really well when I'm in the kitchen, especially when there's kids running all around and husbands, mm -hmm. you know, with what to say is <laughs> I like to set timers. So cooking something like a cacio e pepe where, which is a baked casserole. So we're actually yep. going to need to par cook our noodles because the noodles are then what? going to go your casserole dish and the entire casserole is going to continue cooking. So you don't want fully cooked noodles. If you fully cook your noodles before you compose your casserole, then what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a mushy casserole. And our objective is a really, really crispy casserole. Hopefully everyone who's cooking with us has their empty grease um, baking sheet already in the oven. So when we take it out, it's going to get really, really hot and smoking. Um, does anyone have any questions? Your written directions said a cup and a half of Parmesan, and then you said a cup. Yeah. So the extra half of the cup is going to be at the end because we really want to, some of the Parmesan is in our mixture, so it'll melt throughout the casserole. The end, the remaining half of a cup, so I have about, yeah, like a half, three quarters, um, is going to go on the top. So we get that really crispy, blistered, cheesy top that's like, you just want to like pick off with your fingers. I'm just going to check my noodles. Now, the only other thing we want to do is have our, hold on one second, just checking my pan. Okay. The only other thing that we want to make sure that we have is a little bit of olive oil. Um, when we're, when our noodles are done, it's going to be really important. I do this all the time to toss the noodles right away in a little bit of olive oil so they don't stick together. If we were cooking a traditional cacio e pepe, at this point in the recipe, I would also encourage you to bring, to remove a half a cup of the pasta water to re-add to your pasta when you finish it with the butter, Parmesan, and pepper in your pan. The natural pasta water is such an awesome thickening agent for sauces. Even if you're just at home cooking your kids like a pasta with tomato sauce, undercook your pasta a little bit, strain it, mix it with a little olive oil, Get your tomato sauce going with a little bit of that starchy, salty pasta water, and then finish cooking your tomato your pasta in the tomato sauce. It will make such a tremendous difference in the outcome of your dish because your pasta, when it finishes cooking in the sauce, really actually absorbs the sauce. So it's no longer just topped with the sauce, it's really incorporated with the sauce or with a pesto or whatever sauce you're serving that night. That's one of the tips that I've learned along the way when you go to certain Italian restaurants and you're like, this is so simple, but it's amazing. A lot of time, that's the key. They're finishing cooking the pasta in whatever sauce it's being served in. 
So we're doing the same thing today. I think I have about three more minutes left on my timer until my noodles are perfectly cooked. How is everyone doing? Trying to like scroll through and see if I see any familiar faces. I miss everyone. We're actually in Florida right now. So that's fun. Oh, hey, Lily. Oh, I, I know a thing or two about Jewish cooking in Florida. Wait. I do a new cooking. Wait, sorry, what was the question? I said they know a thing or two about Jewish cooking down in Florida. <laughs> they do. We're in Lauderdale by the sea, which I never actually heard of before. Um, it's like a actually very beachy little town. It's not like, you know, the grandparents in Boca. But my kids did get to see their grandma who has been in her apartment unit since March, hasn't like left or seen anyone except for a doctor's appointment. She's 97 years old and lives alone. So part of coming here was really just to like hug her from afar. Okay, so first thing that we're going to do is get the pasta out of the water if everyone's pasta is ready. I'm just gonna get some hot things. Excuse me, Lynn, you should go down. It's gonna be hot. Okay, hold on. I have way too many schools from the kids. Okay. So we're gonna strain the pasta. And as I mentioned before, here is my pasta. I'm going to give it a little bit of olive oil. Yep, I'm just going to put it right back over my pan to catch the olive oil. I'm just going to give that a quick toss. Now, really important step here. Sometimes when you're cooking with eggs and you're making a casserole dish, these noodles are really, really hot. So what you don't want to do is just dump all your noodles into your casserole mixture because what will happen is the hot, the steam and heat from the noodles are going to cook and curdle your eggs. So what we do is a simple process called tempering. So we're going to take one spoonful of noodles and add them to the casserole mix. And we're going to give it a little mix. So a little bit of the noodle will warm the eggs, but it won't cook the eggs. So little by little, we're going to add the noodles to the mixture. Slowly but surely. This has really become like one of my family's, like it's not like we make this on Rosh Hashanah anymore. This is something that my husband and my brother request all the time. And what's kind of like funny but not is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the restaurant Lilia by Missy Robbins in Brooklyn, but it's one of the best Italian restaurants in New York City, in my opinion. And she like last month went on Instagram saying that she made a cacio e pepe kugel. And I want to be like, I invented that last Russian shot. So you heard it here first. <laughs> okay, now that our stuff is tempered, I'm going to add all the noodles. And we're going to give it a real stir. Chloe, are you around? Can you stir? Okay. All right. Now, the last step, if anyone has their kids around like me, just be careful because your casserole dish is going to be screaming piping hot when we take it out of the oven. When you're making baked macaroni and cheese or any sort of dish where you like those crispy edges, brownies. Whenever I make brownies, I always put the pan greased up in the hot oven before I bake the brownies. It's such an awesome trick to make sure 
that you get those crispy edges and bottoms. All right, that looks perfect though. Okay, so make sure you get a trivet. I'm gonna use, I love you though. I am going to use a small baking sheet right here so that I can put my casserole dish on something hot. Okay, so let me get my towels. Do you wanna do the pouring? Do the pouring. I do the boring, Mom. Okay. Excuse me. Hot, hot, hot. Excuse me, hot. Excuse me, hot. Excuse me, hot. That's hot, hot. Okay. You can see. Hot, super hot casserole dish. For those of you, can you be quiet for one second? I don't need to sit. Okay, I want you to hear what's going to happen when I add this. Can you guys hear the sizzling? That means it's burning. It's piping. I feel like it's so now I'm going to spread it evenly throughout the casserole dish. Okay, make sure you get it into the corners. Make sure your five year old doesn't touch it. A lot of multitasking around here. Okay. Yum. I don't know who's making it, but it already smells like so hot and buttery. And yes, so I can tell oh. right now how delicious this is going to be for the <laughs> first time. Um, okay. And what's great is it really is simple and it feeds a lot of people and it's really fan friendly. Um, it's kind of <laughs> Lily's like, is it healthy? Okay. Now, obviously, the piece to reduce on. We are going to finish it. No, no, no. It's too hot. With the remaining Parmesan cheese. What amazing. It isn't amazing. I've never tried this before. Okay. All right. I'm going to basically just use all the Parmesan that was left in my container. And then we're going to finish it with a final sprinkle of salt. And a final sprinkle of pepper. Now this is going to go in the oven 25 to 30 minutes. Excuse me, Cloud, can you open the oven for me, sweetheart? Thank you. <laughs> you will know that your casserole dish is done when the top of it is browned and bubbly. My last tip that I have, whenever I make a lasagna or a macaroni and cheese or any sort of a baked type casserole dish, you re aside from the fact that you would just like burn your mouth terribly if you ate it out of the oven, it really needs to set. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but if you cook a lasagna and you take it out of the oven, you try serving it right away, it kind of like all the pieces start falling off like a cascade. Same thing with macaroni and cheese. You're not gonna get that nice, like square, beautiful serving. Cover it with tin foil, let it set five to 10 minutes. And then when you go to cut it, you'll be able to get really nice, beautiful squares, especially if you're doing a dinner where you maybe wanna pre-serve people, you know, a portion of the meat that you've cooked along with the kugel. Letting it rest will really allow you to serve it in a much easier fashion. Any questions? So the so the, the directions were three fifty for forty five. You switched to three seventy five and cut the time in half. Yeah. Was that because was, of this lesson? I amended it a little bit. Three seventy five. I think three seventy five for twenty five to thirty. The key here, since your noodle is already cooked, it's really about like getting the nice browning on the outside. And obviously cooking your eggs. I have a question, Erica. You have, you, I see that your stove is electric. Is your oven electric? Because I know there's a difference when you cook with electric versus gas, the timing changes. Yeah, so funny you ask because this is, I'm in a rental house right now. Um, and I'm, I usually have a gas stove so I can like kind of figure out how long it's gonna take for my water to boil. Here, it was like looking at it, it was like little tiny bubbles. Hopefully it worked out. Um, 
My oven here is, I guess it must also be electric. Just make sure if you're doing, if you are using a, an oven with a convection um, option, your food's gonna cook much faster. So if I say 375 for 25 to 30 minutes in a convection oven, that's probably 20 minutes tops. Right. Lily. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is the Lily show. <laughs> She's adorable. <laughs> Everyone at school so much. She's had a year of homeschooling with mom. Um, <laughs> any questions? So I have a question. Um, I'm used to having carbonara, and this is Cassio Pepe. Now carbonara is it, it's because it has eggs, right? This also has okay. eggs, but in a different order. So okay. could this be also be? So what's the? Uh, What's the uh, difference? So, Chloe before tonight said, Mom, I don't understand why we can't just say we're from Italy and teach everyone how to make carbonara. Because that is one of our favorite things in this house. And if you were paying attention, one of the things that I said earlier is about the pasta water and reserving the pasta water. So to make the perfect carbonara, because this, that's one of my favorite dishes too, the key, you cook your pasta again. You only want to cook it maybe two thirds of the way through. When you strain that pasta, you still want it to have a bite. While your pasta is cooking, fry up a ton of bacon. I mean, mm -hmm. carbonara, I don't think there's like a limit of how much bacon you should Agreed. put carbonara so yep. like really really go for it because that bacon grease is essentially what's going to be the sauce mm -hmm. yep. for the carbonara so in one pot you've got your pasta cooking in heavily salted water in the other pot you've got your bacon sauteing and when all the fat is rendered out you can put it over low heat instead of mm. high heat then you take mm. about a half a cup of your pasta water before you strain your pasta, strain your pasta, toss it in olive oil, just like we did tonight. And then in your pot with the bacon grease over medium heat, mm. add the pasta water to the bacon grease, add about mm, a half a cup of milk or cream. Let that boil, boil and go. Let it reduce a little bit. Then you're gonna throw your pasta back in there for about two minutes and really let it finish cooking and absorb right. the bacon grease. Oh, sounds because delicious. I usually use a full box of pasta when I make carbonara. Have three egg yolks ready on the side. Mm. When the pasta comes off, when the pasta comes out, it's like mixed with the bacon grease and the cream, you put it in your serving bowl, big pinch of pepper, big pinch of salt, three egg yolks, use your tongs, mix it consistently for one minute. Perfect carbonara every time. Thank you. Erica, can you tell us a little bit about how, about your professional experience, like how you became a chef and what that journey was like for you? Um, I originally in a past life wanted to be a newscaster. And in order to get into graduate school, I thought that I should probably have some sort of like journalistic enter, you know, enterprises on my resume. Um, and I went to the newspaper and they didn't have any jobs. And I sort of made an argument that like, you're writing like minor versions of what the Washington Post is writing. Like why not have lifestyle items that are unique to your paper? So they agreed and I became the GW food critic. Um, I did not get into any journalism graduate programs. Um, so when I got to New York, my resume, like the last thing on it was sort of food writing. Um, and as I got more and more invested in doing that, I created a company called Always Hungry. And it just never made sense to me how people who critique food, for example, the incredible writers at the New York Times, 
the writers of the New York Times who can make or break people's careers, they come from the history department. <laughs> like they come from like the politics room. Like it's just a lateral move within the New York Times. They have no connection to cooking. And I just felt like if I was putting myself in a position where I was gonna say whether people's food was good or bad, that it was only respectful and proper of me to get a formal training. So I went to um, French Culinary Institute in Soho. Um, and then for the past decade, I was the assistant to Chef Chris Santos of Chopped and the Food Network. And now, because of COVID, I do cooking demos at home. Usually, it's just me. <laughs> but because it's Le Mans, these guys really wanted to get in on the fun. Right, Lo? Yeah. When you went to the culinary school, did you start from scratch? Like, did you know, or did you come in with some skills? Literally start from scratch. My mom was the world's worst cook. Like. Her idea of dinner, I mean, she tried, but her idea of dinner was literally chicken breast in a baking dish with salsa poured on top and she would call it salsa chicken. Um, but my grandmothers on both sides were actually like huge balabustas. And so I think that it might've just skipped a generation. Um, and the really cool thing about culinary school is even though I went to a French culinary school, so we were taught really specific techniques and like Frenching chicken bones and consomme and things that aren't really that necessarily useful. The most important thing that I learned is that you have to season your food. So it sounds so simple, but I think that people don't appreciate the importance of salt and pepper Ooh. even if you're just roasting a few heads That's of broccoli salt. with olive oil for dinner you're seasoning that broccoli you're makes a huge so difference we use a lot of garlic powder and onion powder in my house i think they're a really great way of adding flavor to things without like over salting your food um so i really went into culinary school with not much but when I came out with it, it's, it's, it's more about having the confidence in the kitchen than anything. Anyone else? Anyone else have questions about how to make anything else? No, I liked your story and I'll just say, I happened to read one of the books I read during quarantine was Born Round, I think it's called, which was Frank yeah. Bruni's memoir, um, who was the previous, one of the restaurant critics yeah. for the New York Times and who's just a really great writer in general. Now he's an op-ed writer, I think. Yeah, we can review. And it, but it's about his, a lot of it's about his family and his fight with his weight. I mean, that's really what yeah. the book's about and his, his fight. It's a really good book. So I would recommend that. But, but well, he talks about how he ascended to be the food writer and he's not from the culinary world. Yeah, like Frank Bruni is kind of like an exact example of why I went to culinary school. Totally, he's a great writer. But I mean, I just remember in my heyday of writing that restaurants would open and um, if they got three stars from the New York Times, it would be impossible to get into for the next five years. And if they got one star from the New York Times, like no one, everyone would cancel their reservations. Like it just had such a profound impact on the viability of these restaurants. And I just also think there is a difference between being a great writer and being able to articulate, it's not whether you liked it or not to me. It's about, hey guys, my cousins are here. It's about what didn't you like? Why didn't you like it? What could have been done to make it better? And I just don't think that someone like Frank here, Bruni, really had the knowledge to be able to answer those questions from a culinary mindset. But he's a great writer. 
And the Times it, isn't calling me, unfortunately. So. <laughs> no, you could probably say the same thing about theater critics, right? They're not, they weren't directors and, and a lot of criticism. They do have a lot of power. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's not going to change. Um, I do think more and more people who, you know, I guess the, when I was writing, Instagram wasn't around yet. So today, everyone's a food critic, right? Um, it's almost become this super oversaturated marketplace of opinion. Um, my husband and I joke because my brother's really big into Yelp. So if we're gonna go out to dinner, he wants to like read all the Yelp reviews before we go and look at all the pictures. How can a restaurant be the best restaurant and the worst restaurant at the same time? And like, if you dig in Yelp enough, that's what you're gonna find. Someone hates it and someone loves it, you know? So I think that same thing I learned in cooking school, just being owning what you like, right? There's things that I love that people think are disgusting. Cabbage is like one of my favorite foods. I make it a million ways. I love it. I think it's very versatile. People, if they hurt, they'd be like, that's disgusting, you know? So eat what you like and just make it taste better by seasoning your food. <laughs> Erica, I want to call out two things that you mentioned earlier, which I think, you know, as all of us are our parents or and or educators, I think that, um, you know, your first message about not really feeling like you had a place to fit in at the food, food festival, I think is so important because we all have a history and an identity. We all come from somewhere. And I think that's, you know, as we're in February, we're talking about Black History Month. These events are meant to bring together everyone in our community to honor their heritage, where they've come from. I think that's really important. And I appreciate you being open and transparent that you had some discomfort around where you should fall into that um, structure that we had created for that event. And I think that's a good takeaway for us to think about. It's not just about feeling like you have a nationality to share. It's sharing a, a heritage or a culture or something that you identify with. And then when you talked about, you know, um, uh, starting from scratch in culinary school and just having the guts and confidence, that's such an important message to our students and our children that you know, even if you don't, even if you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, you can still learn, you can still grow. That's what all of us are doing as adults coming to sessions like this and learning from each other. So thank you for bringing that uh, and those messages and those learnings to this session tonight. I appreciate you hearing that. It's funny because when I went to cooking school, I was obviously one of very, very few girls in the school and you have to wear your hair back and the tie, you have to wear, I had to wear like a, like a men's tie and my hair in a hat. So I wore red lipstick, which I never wear, but I wore red lipstick every single day to remind everyone in this school that I was a woman. And I was actually very lucky in um, my boss and my really good friend, Chris Santos, for really giving me the respect as an equal in his kitchen. He has, a um, multiple executive chefs in his restaurants that are women. And it's just really awesome to be able to work for an organization all these years that really doesn't have a gender bias because that's such a common thing in the kitchen particularly. I have to say I'm inspired because I am not a great cook. <laughs> so um, thinking about going to some type of cooking school. So it's really great to know you started from scratch. And yes, baby there, steps. Yeah. Yeah. Baby steps. I'm actually going to just check really quick on my casserole. All right, I think mine needs about five, seven more minutes. What about you, Steve? You know, the it's, other thing- It needs I about nine that, minutes. Uh, the other I, put thing, it at, I put it at 25. You know, Lily's, you know, tried to outshine my Chloe today, which is typical in this house. But one of the things I would really encourage is, you know, I told you that my mom wasn't really a cook, so I didn't really grow up cooking that often in my house, um, which is maybe one of the reasons when I went to school, it was like so out of my comfort zone. But my kids, Chloe like makes eggs for everyone now as a second grader. She's been cooking eggs and she's like three years old. Um, I let my kids use really um, ceramic knives. I teach them 
that when you're slicing something, um, I'll use a pen, always to put your thumb under your fingers and to tuck your fingers. When you see chefs on TV that are just like chop, chop, chopping and looking all around like as if they're gonna cut themselves, they'll never cut themselves if their fingers are like this and their knife is straight. But even just teaching our kids some of the basics and the fundamentals of cooking, you know, Chloe, if she wants pasta, she'll like get the water, get it on the pot and get the, get the um, heat going, right? What else do you do in the kitchen? Do stuff like the robots. <laughs> Like what? I cook when you're not here. Anyway, so I do just encourage everyone, if you haven't tried it yet, to just spend more time in the kitchen with the kids. I know sometimes they make a mess, but it's just so great for their learning um, and for their independence. People come over and can't believe the things that I let, I guess, the kids do in the kitchen. But with time and with practice, they gain this, they get the same amount of comfortability around the kitchen and all the tools that I have. So it's really cool actually to watch them. You know, I wanted to ask you, um, what are some of your favorites that you source from Missy Robbins's place? So Missy Robbins, um, Lilia is her like new big hit restaurant in um, Brooklyn. But she has a sister restaurant that she opened um, called Misi, M-I-S-I, -S that's much more pasta forward and better priced. Um, so two dishes that I steal from her because she stole from me. Um, she does a mini lemon ravioli. So if you go into the freezer section of any supermarket, there's like these Italian brands that send mini raviolis about like this big. Um, you buy those and what? Same thing as always, put them in really heavily salted water. And, you know, they only take about two, three minutes to mm -hmm. boil these you really don't want to overcook them but in a separate pan if you do something similar to what we had today two big tablespoons of butter the zest and the juice of an entire lemon a little salt and pepper and a couple tablespoons of that pasta water you strain those raviolis you get them right into that lemon butter sauce and give it a couple twirls around the pan you can recreate the misi lemon ravioli they were so good, <laughs> literally would just, they would bring the plate, we would eat it. We'd be like, okay, we'll take another. They'd bring the plate, we'd eat it. We'd be like, okay, well, it's like, it was addicting. The other thing she does is a raw fennel salad, which I know people, anise flavor can be something that people really have a hit or miss feeling with. I happen to love it, but she shaves it very, very thinly. And she actually adds celery into it, which I know sounds hmm. strange but the crunchiness of the fresh fennel and celery together. And then you have this lemony pasta on the side is just such a winning combination. What does she dress it with? So her dressing, I'm not exactly sure. I have a couple recipes on my website, the kitchen coach that does similar fennel salads, one with jalapenos and celery and one that's served over a bed of a lemon whipped ricotta. I think the dressing regardless is gonna be something super simple, olive oil, maybe a champagne vinegar, lemon juice. I think like one of the easiest things to start cooking at home and healthiest is to always make your own dressings. I mean, most of the salads that I serve in my house is a mixture of stone ground mustard, apple cider vinegar, olive oil, salt and pepper. And then you can riff on it riff on that depending on the different meals that you're making but a super simple like mustardy lemony vinaigrette really goes with everything mm. thanks yeah. no. does anyone want to tell chloe to do her reading <laughs> no, no we need we, we would need jerry here for that Oh, okay. <laughs> have Chloe, any where's Chloe? Is she there? Do their homework? No? Okay, me neither. 
right, I'm gonna get my casserole out so I can show it all to you. Does anyone have any other questions? It can be about anything. I hope some of you go and make that carbonara, I promise you. I made it for my family um, on Shabbat dinner on Friday and it was like such an afterthought because I was getting panicked that there wasn't enough food just like what I typically do. And it was the first thing to go. I should have made two batches of it. I offered to make it again. And everyone was like so full at that point. They were like, no, but it is such a winner. Just you always have to make sure you don't add the eggs till the really, really end. Same concept that we had with this casserole about tempering <laughs> bacon on Shabbat. Yeah, I'm that kind of a Jew, Steve. Okay, I'm getting the... All right, there we have it. Does everyone, and this is really hot, but I just want everyone to notice seriously the corners. Do you see the edges and the corners? That's because we greased the pan and got it really hot. So like I told all of you guys to do, I'm gonna cover this in tin foil. I'm gonna let it sit for five to 10 minutes before we eat it. And then we're gonna, you know, have a party. Can you ask her to put her in? Erica? It looks amazing. Can, Erica, can you show everybody your Instagram site so that people can follow you or put, or put it in the chat? So that people can um, Daniel, my husband, I think is somewhere. I don't know if he's listening. Honey, can you put um, my Instagram? It's at the kitchen coach, coaches with a K. And my website at the kitchen coach. I mean, you know, www. You know what websites are? Thekitchencoach.com. Um, there's a lot of really simple recipes on there for those of you who want to get interested in cooking. And you guys can all get my email from Pilar if you have any other questions or just have any other cooking questions down the line in general. I'm available sometimes when I'm not homeschooling um <laughs> and that's it i want to just thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do this Paige. thank you for acknowledging that it's my first time to get to do the cultural festival i hope maybe next year god willing we will be in person and um i'll figure out how to how to get to do this again this has been oh veronica it looks so good hi Hi, I just took it out. I have electric and it's it's a little different. Every time I cook here, it's it's a little different. Right. But we make it work. You know, that's the most fun part about cooking, you know? Just because exactly. you make a mistake doesn't mean you can't fix it, right? It's like with anything in life. There you go. All right. With that, I'm gonna go. I got family here. Thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. And I really want to hear how it turned out if you cook. Erica, we want to thank you on behalf of the LCA and the entire school for coming and presenting. And I want to thank all of our presenters that, that for the last two weeks have been cooking and putting themselves out there. It's hard. I love to cook. I'm incapable of cooking live like you just did, um, just out of fear of messing up. Um, but I, I love to cook. And we've, we've been in discussion with Erica. Look out for perhaps some night in April. Maybe we're going to have Erica back to do a whole meal for everybody. Um, and we're going to invite other people to come back because those that have participated, whether you've come to watch or cooked, have all enjoyed this event. And I think we're going to keep it going somehow. All right. Everybody have a great night. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank Bye. you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.